So my name is Chris. I'm here at eBay. I'm one of the co-organizers, along with uh, Ramjan and Aditya, who's back here. Um, so usually, what we like to do is have a couple minutes for announcements. Um, so anybody that has a meetup they want to announce, anybody who's hiring, anybody who's looking for a job, anything like that, just uh, go ahead and raise your hand and stand up and shout out what you got. So I think uh, Carl had one. Hi, I'm with the uh, local ACM chapter, the San Francisco Bay Area ACM. And next week, we'll, right here, uh, we'll be having a talk on deep learning. <laughs> so it'll be uh, uh, scalable data science and deep learning with H2O. And Arno Kandel will be uh, speaking. And I'll be same times. Uh, we normally meet on the fourth Mondays. Uh, but because of Labor Day, or uh, Memorial Day, uh, it got shifted. So anyway, hope you can attend. Uh, we're on Meetup. Great, thank you. Anybody else want to make an announcement? Yes, I want to. So you said it was OK to boast like hirings? Anything you want. All right, cool. So my name is Stefan. <laughs> uh, I'm a creative guy from Norway, running a startup on search, which is cool. And we are looking for co-founders and technical geniuses to help make a cool search product. So if you are basically back-end developer or want to make a really nice looking front-end for our product, come talk to me. And we are here for three months, so we can talk it over and try it out if you want to. So yeah. Do you want to pick a spot where you want to stand like after a meetup and see if people yes. like, want to pick a spot? I'm going to be over there. And I'm going to be over there. Excellent. So Norway is cool. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? This one back here? No. Okay, uh, I'll make a quick announcement. So I, I work in search science here at eBay. Um, we're always hiring uh, excellent engineers and researchers, so I will be standing right over there if you want to come talk to me. Um, if nobody else has any announcements, then I'd like to introduce Sean from uh, Dato or Dato. I guess it depends on whatever your preference is. He's going to talk about uh, deep learning in image search, I think. Which should be great. So thank you. We always get asked, is it data or data? We're still letting the market this out. Um, so th thanks a ton for having me, um, Chris, Ron, Don, and Matthew. Yeah. Um, super excited to talk about searching for images. Um, so my name's Sean. I'm originally a physics guy, turned out as a data scientist. I've taken uh, basically everything but the shortest path to get to. So I started off in physics, uh, got a PhD uh, in material science where, where I did uh, device physics, trying to make solar cells uh, more efficient. And that took me down the path of uh, simulating devices a lot. Um, and so I, I spent about half my time writing simulations of the devices, and then the other half doing measurements and a bunch of data analysis. And that led me ultimately into uh, doing data science in earnest. Um, these days, I love predicting apps. So that's me. So who's data? Um, who's heard of data or data? <coughs> what about graph logic? A couple more. The sets are not exactly the same. So, so uh, data, uh, this is us. We're a company, a startup, uh, about two years old. Uh, we're in Seattle. We're a little over 30, I think we're up about 35 people right now. This isn't uh, all of us. And we started off as an academic project about seven years ago uh, at CMU, uh, doing something a little different than we do now, which is basically doing a really, really large scale graph analytics. Um, and that's, that's what the original founding team got uh, known for, which is basically how to use um, things like uh, page rank or triangle counting, sort of prototypical graph analytics tasks on really uh, humongous scale graphs. Turned out that we were really good at building systems like that. And uh, people started asking for the code, and we open sourced a bunch of the code. Uh, and then we started getting interested in recommendation systems, and so we built a collaborative filtering toolkit for GraphG, which was the, uh, uh, one of the open source projects. Um, and people started asking more and more for this stuff, and we had a couple workshops, which, uh, unlike most academic workshops, were, were not the typical 30, 40 people that show up. Um, our first workshop was something like 200 people. And the second year, we were over uh, 350. Um, last year, we upgraded to a conference. Uh, so the only at the time was like the Math Lab conference. We were over 700 people last year. This year, um, uh, we had a two-day, uh, it's called the Data Science Summit, um, and, and that our conference, uh, and we're shooting for more than 1,000 people. 
Um, so that, that basically all came because of the code. Um, a few years ago, uh, we had a choice. We found another uh, company, uh, which was originally called Graph Lab, now called Dino. And we, we founded it for something slightly different. Other than just commercializing this super fast uh, graph analytics engine, we wanted to do something a little different, um, which is basically to make building predictive apps um, easier. So we're all super geeky about um, the intelligent things you can do with machine learning. And usually I have it on my wrist, but I don't today. It's been in this lovely uh, wristband. Um, but uh, these are all, if you think about all the killer apps that are out uh, these days, every single one of them is killer because it has intelligence at the course. We're using machine learning to do something uh, distracting. One I always highlight is my watch here. Uh, this is the Basis V1 smartwatch. And when I bought this uh, uh, two years ago, it was the only smartwatch that would automatically classify whether I was walking, running, or cycling. I'm a cyclist, and I want to keep track of that stuff. Um, and so that was the killer app. Um, so the, that is the iWatch, which is uh, totally in this place that sits back there in the first. Um, so we're excited about the, the applications. And we you know it's recommenders, fraud detection, and stuff. So what do we? Uh, the, the team at Data, what are we about? We're about this concept of going from inspiration, you have an idea, um, to production. How do I make uh, that idea not only practical, go through that proof of concept stage, um, but go all the way to a scalable service. Ultimately, that, that means uh, basically making all stages of that process um, easy for developers and data scientists. So uh, not only developing the idea, but deployment and then management of those predictive apps once they're deployed. Um, we are super interested in enabling you to create um, uh, not only the same things that you already create faster, uh, but also enable you to create new applications that just weren't possible before because it's too much work, um, too much really other stuff. So um, we have a platform which is built for folks like us. Uh, it is three components. Graphlab Create is basically the core tool that you use to do um, do your prototyping uh, and development. It's, the fundamentals are built on scalable, these scalable data structures. The S frame, which is a columnar uh, data structure that's on disk. So columnar means your fast analytics operations and machine learning tasks. On disk means that you can scale the big data. Um, we have S graph, which is a, a graph uh, representation that's built on top of that. Tons of machine learning. Today we're going to talk about um, uh, deep learning and nearest neighbors uh, combined to, to do image search, but we have all sorts of stuff. Uh, and then for deployment, um, we have two products. One's uh, called Predictive Services, and this basically is built so that you don't have to stand up the boring web service code over and over again. So once you create a model, uh, just in a couple lines of code, you can turn that into a scalable, rapidly scalable, fault tolerant uh, service, and we do some quick model version. Um, and then for, let's say you have some complex uh, data pipeline, and there's a bottleneck, you have some task, it's taking a day, you need it to finish in half a day, um, we can do parallelism. So, that's my marketing pitch. Um, uh, we're also hiring, which I'll mention at the end. Um, I have three, I think three demos, um, and, and we'll dive into the details basically of some of the fundamentals of uh, deep learning and how it applies to this. Um, and then uh, do a simple example of it. Okay, so we're gonna start off with uh, fun. So, uh, um, so who, who remembers when, when Google first came out with what was called reverse image search? Okay, so here's, here's how it works. I'm gonna copy, uh, copy an image. You're not married, I'm not married. 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 I'm not 
this little link up here that says for matching images, try search by image. So that's one. So this is search by image for me. Uh, this is by uh, the image. So what we see back, um, so this is now uh, two, three years old. Um, so given that image, we're given uh, responses back that are pages that include matching images. Um, and so it's not just simple match, but also if things are resized to a uh, different resolution, um, they'll, they'll find them. So that's one application. Um, and then there's this uh, interesting one down there, which is visually similar. Uh, we can do visually similar. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is my favorite one. Uh, well, it's a topic. So obviously, um, you're picking up on the, the core uh, part of the image, which is that uh, I'm a very handsome man. <laughs> the beard does. Uh, so that's, that's a, a simple example of the image search. Uh, So what are the applications of stuff like this? So if you think about basically all of the data products that we have built over the last um, five, 10 years, um, a whole lot of those products are, are built on squeezing the most we can out of the text. Um, it's, it's about you know, finding features that describe documents, bag, bag of words, or concepts within those words. And then we build all sorts of stuff. Right? Um, we haven't done much with images. Images are pretty early compared to all the applications we have using text features. So um, just thinking about all the things that we use text for, um, a lot of those same things apply here. So uh, things like recommendations or item search is the most basic. Um, so uh, sort of in extending the concept of more like this, more like my list is an image. Yeah. Um, deduplication, this turns out to be super important, very practical uh, across all sorts of customers we talk to. So when you find someone who has multiple data streams, uh, or uh, even someone like eBay where I have multiple products on the same uh, same site, um, how can I very simply uh, identify that that's the same uh, image? Um, Zillow, one of our customers, the, the core, core issue they have is they get house listings from different streams, um, and they have images that will be slightly different resolution. And so they need a very smart way so that they don't show 100 images where only 20 of them are actually there. So you need to say. Um, fraud and fra finding rule breakers. So uh, if you've ever bought anything on Craigslist, every once in a while you'll, you'll notice someone posts something like, a, I don't know, some crazy new looking Mustang uh, for a bike. Um, and you also see that they post that same thing for something else that's not a bike. Uh, you'll see the same image show up a lot personals that shows up a lot. Um, so that, that's another application. And then rule breakers, uh, uh, Zillow has this rule, uh, and I think others have something similar, which is basically, if you post an image, you can't have text on the image. So we can't be able to identify that. Um, medicine, uh, all sorts of applications, but just imagine you're in charge of a bunch of uh, MMR images. Uh, and, and you're trying to uh, find other cases that are related to your patients. Okay. A lot more like this brain scan. Okay. Um, or how about just new cool apps, new ways to interact with other stuff. Build something that make me care more about others. Okay, so, so how does uh, image search work? Um, to get there, we're gonna just start with a brief um, uh, step <coughs> on machine learning and then go into deep learning and then to So if you, who, who doesn't know, who, who doesn't use machine learning actually as a sort of part of their data center? Yeah. Everyone uses machine learning as part of their day-to-day -day work here? Okay, good. So then <laughs> you guys can tell me what this is. <laughs> So this is um, this is one of the earliest uh, uh, experiments and applications in machine learning, the famous Rosenblatt experiment. And what these guys did is they had uh, this thing, which was something like a is that a twenty by twenty or forty by forty? Yeah. So 
20 by 20, 20 by 20 photo cell um, grid. And then the task was to detect shapes. So this is the earliest um, image recognition that was done. Um, but all of this was super mechanical. So they had actual photo cells, and then uh, they had potentiometers that were on each of these leads uh, in the back. And the task was, um, you know, based on this mass of signals that are coming out, and given various um, various uh, electronic weights between the signals, how can you find the right weights so that you can learn the shape? So uh, machine learning, of course, is where we have input data. And we have some sort of parameters that we can tune so that we can optimize for some functions so that we can learn and learn. Okay. How about deep learning? So to go to deep learning, uh, we'll start with machine learning. Uh, so, a very, very simple view of machine learning is you have data that goes in, in this case maybe it's an image of a cat, and then you get some response or prediction out uh, of this black box, or that black box is out of there. Um, so, uh, let's say that's any, any algorithm, any machine learning algorithm. Um, oh, that's strange. One second, something there. So machine learning. <coughs> and then the standard process we all follow is generally supervised. Um, so I mean, we have some sort of label that we're trying to get. And so this starts with some sort of labeled data. I do things like create train test splits. Um, I create a model, and then I validate the model, and usually learn that it's not good enough, and I need to do more work. Um, and so that leads me to either adjusting those hyperparameters, so adjusting tuning the knobs, um, or going back to the data. Um, so let's look at a very simple example uh, of that, and then we'll dive into it. Okay. Yeah, you bet. Um, okay, so uh, in this case, we're going to do a very, very simple machine learning task, which is to build a neural net classifier to classify whether or not uh, there's a car. So very simple. So we're going to go through those same steps. Um, and in this case, I'm going to use Graphbot to create. So here I'm going to load some data. And I can take a look at uh, take a look at what the data looks like here. So these are black and white images. And you see uh, these are the first four that are in this set. And you see the top one and the bottom one are clearly not cars. And the two middle ones are clearly cars. Um, and I can also see that uh, this is basically the weighting of the positive labels and negative labels here. Number of cars, number of not cars. Um, and I see it's reasonably balanced. So now I'll create a model. Um, and we see here we're using an existing uh, neural net model. See, there's a bunch of details here. Let's go back to this. Um, so in this case, I'm feeding in that training data. And I'm trying to predict the target, which is the label, whether or not it has a color. So this is done. And then usually I do something like evaluate the model. So I look at something like this, the truth table, and you do overall accuracy. Um, or if I'm fancy, and I look at precision recall or some sort of information retrieval metrics. So in this case, um, we see we're really good at predicting whether or not uh, there's a problem. So that's cool. So that's a very simple example. Um, and I was actually using deep learning. We'll go deeper. So what's special about deep learning? Um, deep learning, what's <coughs> special is, is basically that black box, what's inside it. Um, it's the same task. Uh, only in, in this case, we're, pre uh, we're predicting cars instead of cats. Um, <coughs> who who uses neural nets actually in their work? Who knows what neural nets are? Almost everyone. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Um, so what's crucial here? Um, obviously, deep learning is all the rage these days. So there's a meetup this week. There's a meetup next week um, on the same stuff. Um, and there's a couple reasons that it's 
that it's, uh, I would say, um, popular these days. A lot of it has to do with the application um, that are now possible given GPUs. Um, so uh, at the end of the day, deep, deep, um, deep learning, just a, a, another sort of rebranding of, of neural nets. And the sort of fundamental um, concepts here are that you have input, um, and then the model is basically uh, a, com a complex set of functions that connects those inputs to different layers. And you can think about going between each of those layers as a set of transformations. Um, where here, typically, this is, this is something, like, uh, something like a sigmoid function um, that depends on some number of these inputs that are adjacent. Um, people always talk about the topology of a neural net, so uh, that's basically the specific architecture. So there's a couple of details of that. So in general, neural net uh, has multiple layers. The input is something like an image. The output is something like a prediction. Um, then we talk about convolutional nets, which are used a bunch these days. And basically all of this is, is rather than having every input connected to every element in, in a, a layer, that those middle layers, you uh, are strategic about how you make those connections. And so this is showing how you're connecting everything, you're just connected to you. And then those middle layers, there's two kinds of layers that matter. Um, there's the so-called uh, convolutional layer, where you create involved features in that transformation. And so, so in this case, um, there's a certain operation. If you look closely, this is basically saying, OK, take, uh, take everything that's diagonally related to this um, and sum them up. So I see 1 times 1, 1 times 0, plus 1 times 1, 1 times, uh, 0 times 0, 1 times 1, and so on. Add those up, and I get a 4 here. And so I'm taking that, if this is, let's say, a, a, an image, those are pixel intensity factors. And then I'm compressing those um, down to a single one. And I can go through my entire image. And so now I've just transformed that input to uh, a new representation. The other kind of transformation that matters is what's called pooling. So this is similar, but where uh, we take for a certain patch of the image, we do things like take the maximum intensity of all the pixels in that uh, range. And that's important for identifying uh, the centers of certain objects. Same kind of idea. We're doing a transformation on a set of pixels and then representing it as some reduced dimensionality. OK. So that's the basic stuff. Who's seen this thing before? So this is, uh, um, was anyone actually involved in the project? <laughs> uh, okay, so this is a, sort of a famous, uh, these days, famous topology. Um, and it's a very specific architecture used um, to, uh, to train an image classifier, a multi-label image classifier, uh, on a data set called ImageNet. So this is uh, uh, Jeff Kenton's um, research group. And basically each one of these uh, layers, each one of these uh, segments is a layer, uh, and then those domains are different transformations. Um, they describe how each of the layers are connected to each uh, other. You can see it's pretty complicated. Um, something that's maybe not obvious, uh, those transformations turn out to be uh, fundamentally related to major calculations. And so just like doing um, uh, just like solving eigenvalue problems, turns out that CPUs are good for that. CPUs are also good for doing these kinds of tasks. <coughs> so it turns out if you're doing very large scale uh, uh, image problems with deep learning, um, it's important to be able to learn from these things. Okay, so uh, when I look at this, <laughs> and I look at uh, running stuff on GPUs, um, it doesn't sound like the easiest thing. I, I, for me, I started off in physics. I learned machine learning to solve tasks. Um, I didn't. I didn't learn the details on how to construct a uh, 27 layer uh, neural net. Uh, but I'm still interested in the application of this stuff. Um, 
So in general, we're really interested in figuring out how to create a new um, And I'll show, show what we can do there. So we started off with that, uh, with that simple demo. Uh, let's go to one that's slightly more complex. So this um, demo, which was up earlier, this is using our whole platform where we've uh, trained a neural net, which is that same image net, uh, crazy topology from that um, group. And then we took that model, deployed it as a service that's running on Amazon. Uh, and so now it's a live restful service, and you can query it with any image. And so uh, in this case, unlike the cars, I didn't look at the details there, it was a pretty small data set. Here we're looking at one and a half million images and 10,000 different vehicles. Um, so we can predict some interesting things here. So uh, the way this works, given an image, I can uh, make a prediction about things um, that the image is most likely to be. So in this case, this is a balloon. This was in the training set, so it's a balloon. I can click on something else. Image is set up, predictions come back. Tiger shark, this was in the training set. Tiger shark, that's cool. Um, but of course, what's always most interesting is when you get images that weren't in the training set. Um, so, me. so what this uh, little widget does is it finds images from Gate. Okay. So let's say something like, let's look at this guy. So this is not in the training set. It seems very confident in whatever this is, and this is in a place that makes sense. Um, so this is a, a, also a very basic application of uh, image stuff that you can imagine is pretty powerful, right? Um, but we can do more easy things. So, so to get there, we started off with a really simple API so that we can uh, basically create neural nets without having to know all of the details of uh, the topology. So we have a bunch of pre-built uh, topologies. Um, so Jeff Denton's uh, topology that's been shown to work for that kind of stuff. You can just plug and play and, and uh, run. Um, but something else uh, that's super fun and relevant is uh, it's a good easy button. It's called feature extraction and transfer learning. Uh, how about there? Who, who knows what transfer learning is? Um, <coughs> transfer learning is a very, very simple concept and very powerful for this kind of thing. So the idea is you train a model on one task, and then you use that model for some other task. And so uh, a simple example, I learned to walk, and then I use that knowledge to uh, learn to run. Um, I use that knowledge to run. Um, or I train an image tagger to do something like that, recognize cars, and then uh, I use that tagger to recognize uh, trucks. The general concept here, you've probably all seen images like this top one. This is sort of representing what happens to an image as it goes through uh, a neural net through all those transformations. The idea of transfer learning is rather than uh, going all the way to the end where you make a prediction, you're going to stop somewhere midway through and then just extract uh, whatever the representation is of that uh, of the data at that point. So it's something like stopping here and pulling that out and then feeding that into some other task. Could be a classification task, could be a nearest neighbor's task, could be a clustering task, so. So here the process is just slightly different than we did before for standard machine learning. So typically I'm starting off with labeled data <coughs> and then I've created a model um, using that labeled data. And then I'm gonna use that model um, as a transform, basically. And I use that model to extract features from any new, in this case, new images. And then I'm going to build a simpler model um, uh, and just use the representation of those images that I want from that features. So you could do something else that makes sense. So uh, let's see how to do that. <coughs> I won't show this now, but this is a hilarious video. <laughs> okay. So in this case, we're going to do transfer learning, where we take that uh, initial model that we uh, we trained the image net, 
uh, chain with the InnoSnet data set. Um, and then we're going to use it to find shoes. Okay. And so let's take a look at the data first. Okay. So when I look up here, there's 6,000 images up here. Um, so it's not a huge data set. Um, it's huge considering it's all shoes only from Nordstrom. So Nordstrom has uh, about 6,000 women's shoes. Um, and, and these are what they look like right there. So tons of different kinds of shoes. <coughs> so what I'm gonna do here, can you guys see this okay? Is I'm gonna take that, that neural net model, the image net model, um, I'm gonna load it. So this is a pre-trained model, and we actually uh, offer this here, you can get it. Um, and let's take a look at that model. So originally this had a little over 1.3 million, uh, this was about 1.3 million uh, examples used to train it. Um, so you can get it here. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at that first image. So the way feature extraction works, we're gonna take an image and then feed it through um, Feed it through the neural net and just extract that last layer. Uh, so this is the image. I'm going to use this, and then I'm going to extract using that model. Just dot extract features and feed in that image and see what we get back. Okay. So I see I get back so that one image. I get one row, which is basically a, a sparse loop. Okay. So what's this doesn't mean much, um, but one useful way to think about this is that image that went in was 256 by 256 pixels and there's three color channels. So think about what the total number of dimensions did, uh, was going in and what the resulting number of dimensions was coming out. We had almost 200,000 dimensions representing uh, that image. And then we reduce it down by pushing it to that number to a little over 4,000. And that's uh, for anyone that plays around with things like nearest neighbors, that's meaningful because if you get too big in dimension space, um, then you can't build your models. So this is basically one way of thinking about this is a dimension reduction uh, process. Yeah. Do all those zeros mean you could reduce it further? Um, not necessarily. So the the uh, so other images are going to have something else in place of that zero. Oh, that's for a particular image. Yeah, okay, yeah. all right, sorry. I don't know that we have the best connection, but. Uh, okay. Is that still using the passing it through the Alex Nets, or is it? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay, so, so that's just a simple example of how you should think about this. Um, we've gone through and uh, extracted features for all the images. It's about 200 images per second, which is pretty fast. Uh, uh, quite fast enough. Okay, so, um, so I've extracted features. My next step is to create a uh, nearest neighbors model. So I'm just gonna take those features, and use nothing else, and then just say, okay, which, which vectors are close to this vector, and which vectors are far? Very simple. Um, so I'm gonna feed in the <coughs> images, and then the features are, are those uh, extracted features. So in this case, um, it's pretty fast. It's only 6,000 images. We can use uh, brute force uh, uh, nearest neighbors. If I had tons and tons of images, then I'd, I'd care about other forms of uh, nearest neighbor model to make it more efficient. So things like ball tree, we're using, uh, using hatching to, to find more search. Okay, so now I have a, a nearest neighbor, neighbors model trained on those features. Uh, now we can query it. So we can actually do some, do some searching. So let's take a look at one image here. Okay. So this is a high heel. It's clearly a pretty airy high heel. Uh, let's look for some other images. So I'm just going to take that nearest neighbor model and then query it given this image is being put. Out. 
Uh, so what, what's the important thing? So uh, these are basically the indices of the different image. And so I see I get a, a ranked list and it's ranked by distance. In this case, we were just doing simple Euclidean distance between, uh, between these vectors, these arrays. So these are the, this is the query, um, and then we see the nine bunches in our images. Not bad. Okay. Let's try something totally different. <coughs> okay. Pretty different. Catalog booth. It's closed for now. So we're going to do the same. Uh, only this time I'm going to query for all. So you can just see that stuff. Okay. Okay. So here's my query. And then nine most similar. I see there's one other catalog booth, and then lots of other booths that are different. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so those are the t top top ten most similar. That's that's fun. How about the least similar? So uh, we have all six cells, and so all we have to do is just go down to the bottom of the rank list, and just go down to the bottom distances. So let's say four. So it turns out that there's uh, more than just shoes here. There's some accessories. So clearly, uh, cowboy boot is different than whatever this is. Um, so that makes sense. How about something a little bit more different? Something that's still shoes, but far away. So I'll just pick something that's right in the middle of that distribution. So look at these guys. So this is about halfway to the The query was a boot. Anybody else? <coughs> no boots. Things that are pretty anti boot. Things like uh, sandals um, and, and uh, leather shoes. So, the last piece here. Um, so, all we're doing, you know, the important concept here is just that relevance is basically equivalent to distance. And so, if I just look uh, at the top 10, bottom 10 and middle 10, we can just do a quick average to see what the average distance is for each of these. And so I see top 10, I'm in uh, around 42 units. <laughs> um, bottom 10 is around 93, so close to 100. The middle is a bit of a so around 71. So you can imagine building something that's just all about understanding that distance and how that distance maps to your particular application. Any questions? Yeah. How how you could come out even if you could get the shoe in the middle, what is not the I mean, what was the other attribute which you only bring the shoes or a stand or something like that? I mean, what is that feature that can really make it look like a shoe? I mean, it like, looks like amazing. I mean, you just by putting the changing so the distance, how exactly you can control whether it's a shoe or boot or whatever. Oh so so it's more about um, so it's distance, it's distance for images relevant to your query. So uh, we could have done the same kind of analysis for the high heel shoe. And we'd see something similar, which is probably in the middle of the high heel shoes uh, uh, ranking would be something like boots. Uh, is the transfer learning, uh, which layer you pick, does it matter in ending up with shoes or something in um, The short answer is it matters. Uh, but usually you don't, as a, as a developer, you don't care. People have found out that, okay, well, the bottom layer works best for this kind of task. And so uh, then, then all you have to do is to choose that bottom layer. But for sure, as you go further and further up, um, dimensions are bigger, generally. Uh, and, and you have different representations of the, of the image. Yeah. Um, how mean are you the differences in scale, lighting, um, 
all the things that make industry hard. Yeah, totally. Um, the answer there though really depends. <laughs> so you see this is, um, uh, so the model that we were using um, was trained on, it's all about the, the images that we originally trained on. And so we trained on a million and a half images um, that had objects in them. And it was about, uh, so we could recognize whether or not there's a chihuahua, whether or not chihuahua is filling the whole image, or it's just a part of the image. Um, so that should suggest that it would work well for things that scale, um, but I actually don't, I'm not sure without trying it out. So uh, rotations are fine, generally, because here you're not actually doing a, um, it's more, if you look at these, uh, if you look at the images, it's more about things like how much white space do you have here, um, what's, what's the contrast, uh, what are the colors, it's, it's about sort of the core structure of the image. And so this, this image, um, I am willing to bet, uh, if we rotate it and move it in space, uh, we <coughs> the same distance. If you use the dimensional convection, what does it compare? Um, I don't know what the short answer is there. Does anyone, uh, does anyone what the question? answer there? So the, the question is, um, I explained this as sort of a form of dimensionality reduction. And so uh, can you do the same kind of thing by using something like PCA? It doesn't look the same, definitely. Yeah. <clears throat> like if you go back and look at like the original like engine paper, um, where you talked about the um, sort of pre-training and stuff, they have some really nice Images that they they've done with like two dimensional projections from PCA versus um, like RVMs or something, and it was the, the RVM like which is the equivalent of this is it separates things beautifully, and the PCA is still just kind of a a big clump. The, the, you know, P, PCA is it's it's trying to basically learn the correlations between between different pixels, um, and that's a simpler transformation than. than <coughs> You can learn much deeper things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, all the shoes in the data set seems to have the same orientation toward the photographer. Uh, as it were, if the shoe is taken. Uh, yeah, that's the question. <coughs> um, uh, the question was, yeah, does it adapt to rotation in different Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my, my, um, my gut reaction uh, is that it should hold, hold up well to different orientations. But you didn't just directly have us from Hudson. The best thing <coughs> is try that. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, the images are normalized. They are in the same part of you know, the same scaling and all. And that's where PCA works. But when you use uh, neural networks, uh, they uh, take into consideration features. That's for sure. Yeah. So if you have some human uh, face, then it will uh, take a look at eyes and other edges. And you can find similarity between those features. It won't just look at the plain normalized image. I think that's the difference between PCA and the uh, uh, neural. Okay. Good answer. Yeah. You said a little bit more about, um, you talked about the processing involving feature extraction. Yeah. So, what kind of feature? <coughs> so, that's. <laughs> um, so neural, you know, it's it's not it's not that different to how we describe latent factors. You know, how do you describe a latent factor? You, you do some sort of matrix decomposition. What does that represent? We always try to map it to human things. We say, well, um, like if I'm building like an ender model, I learn a latent factor. I'm sort of learning the fingerprint of uh, the scratch to you. I'm learning something about your interests. Whether or not you're someone that likes action movies. Uh, versus uh, romance movies. There's an analogous thing um, with the features we extract here, and we always describe them in human terms. Uh, we say things like, well, the features that are extracted are uh, things that they map to contrast and texture and uh, amount of white space. 
reality is that's uh, a total simplification of what's actually expected. So I don't have a good, succinct answer there, other than it's it's a, a, a reduced dimension that sort of intuitively maps to some of those things, but it's not really right. But I mean, the, the, the processing, as you showed it, involves matrix transformation. Yeah. So a lot of this will depend upon how those matrices are designed. That's right. And, and, and many of them will be designed to enhance a certain aspect of the image or identify a certain aspect. Yeah. So are the particular kinds of <coughs> transformations that are being found to be effective, or do you just try randomly a lot of stuff to see what works well? So the research world tries lots of lots of random stuff with some intuition. Um, uh, but what what comes out is um, simple things. <laughs> so um, it's we went through a couple of these things. Um, so you, and you can even just look at the these representations and you can see um, there's sort of things that are sort of like what the um, things that represent uh, like the low frequency features in the image. And there's often transformations that lead to that. Um, if you looked at these simple examples, uh, you know, a cooled feature. A cooled feature, you're saying, okay, I'm going to go chug through these uh, pixels, these blocks of pixels, and then I'm going to collapse down that block of pixels, that uh, box of <laughs> pixels, to whatever the um, maximum intensity value is. Uh, and so that's that's uh, but I, I think that's that's basically um, sort of smoothing out the texture. That's that's just one one way of uh, basically getting out the lower lower frequency components. But I, I, the, the, I think the critical thing though is that a human's not going in and saying like this part of the network is doing the edge detection and, and playing that's with right. the matrix. And saying this part of the network is going to do texture detection and playing with the metrics. This whole thing is learned. All that's getting fed in is pixels. We can talk more after. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, okay. <coughs> so that is the simple example uh, of using transfer data. Um, there's, of course, tons of other things you can do with those those features. Once you have uh, a vector that represents your image, then you can do things like um, uh, you can do things like uh, clustering or linear classification. These are ways you can take those features, combine them with some textual features that you extract. Let's say that you're trying to classify a web page. So now you can do something like take all the images, process them through uh, a linear feature extractor. Now you have a uh, numeric representation of those. You extract text features, and then do something like mirror tables on uh, the copy, or clustering on all your documents. Okay, that's basically the end of my talk. Um, so a couple shameless plugs. Uh, I mentioned the the conference that we have um, coming up July twentieth, twenty first, in San Francisco, um, and I have for anyone that wants to come, a super killer discount, fifty percent. Um, so the first day, uh, we're expecting about a thousand, thousand folks. First day is general data science machine learning, um, and the second day is uh, all folks uh, that are doing stuff with data, uh, as well as our training that we're doing. So that's coming up uh, in the not so distant future. Go to comp.data.com. <coughs> something that's more immediate, um, if you're eager to uh, play with something like feature extraction or some of the other stuff we do. Um, we're just starting off uh, something with Galvanize. Does anyone know who Galvanize is? Okay. Um, so Galvanize SF, we're doing uh, uh, data office hours uh, up at the office uh, starting tomorrow. So basic idea, bring your laptop and some data, and we'll sit with you and get started on whatever you want to get started on. Uh, tomorrow, 2.30 to 5, followed by some good beers uh, up in uh, Soma, San Francisco. So talk to me or email me. And then uh, other resources, get the software, download it for free. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff that you can build quickly 
kind of do a little learn. Uh, we have a whole section with notebooks to describe all sorts of applications. If you want to learn more, we have a lot of places to all the details. Um, we're hiring tons, uh, basically across the board. So uh, machine learning engineers, uh, general full stack developers, front end web, uh, and then folks to work with customers. Um, but more interesting than any of that stuff, uh, I would love for you to just go create something super awesome. Uh, and hopefully, uh, we'll see you next. So, that's what we got. <coughs> Thank you. Happy for any questions. I'm not an expert, but thanks for learning to tell us the conditions of the and like in particular in this case, it is really worked well here because the unit map is just a model that just came in, so many pictures, it's really hard then to shoot. Versus say I did a uh, model that only came from faces or uh, Yeah, totally. So the, the short answer is the, the mm -hmm. set of images that you train on that is um, But it turns out that uh, the image map data sets, it's general enough that you can expect a general feature. So uh, one simple example that we have a customer called Compology, who's up in San Francisco. They are trying to reinvent the waste management industry. And the way they're doing that is they have uh, webcams and a bunch of industrial dumpsters. And so, so their task, their goal is basically to uh, efficiently use trash dumps. So don't pick, don't pick up uh, dumpsters that are so they have webcams. Every two hours, they send a picture of the inside of the dumpster. So they're images that are literally of garbage. Um, and they're basically using exactly this process. So they're uh, extracting features from their super low quality uh, images of trash. And then they, uh, they classify the fullness uh, based on what they data. So it's, a, it's one data point, um, but uh, there are many, many others out there that just pretty well. It's a good model to make fun of. Suppose I have a pile of GPUs. Can you guys make use of them? <laughs> Can we specifically? Yep. So today we run on um, we run on GPUs. Uh, we run on uh, right now. If you have mul multiple cores, um, we only use one. In the next release, the release after that, uh, we try to use the best GPUs. Cool. I guess a specific practical question. Uh, yeah. It's not really new yet. Um, so I, I'm giving a big aerial photo, and I want to identify the fact that there's, there's landscape of cars, and I want to identify all cars in there, like sections that represent something else. Yeah. Is there something that can help me in that direction? So you can, um, what you need is, we don't have, um, we have sort of the high level building block for. Uh, doing some of that analysis. Um, we don't have the utilities yet to, so what you, what you would end up doing there is chunking up the image um, into different regions, so part of the pipeline. Uh, so there's tools that we can start to make better use of that. Um, you use that for sort of that first part of the pipeline and then future uh, extraction or, or image uh, optimization. So I, I actually did something a little different, ah. which was we took a model that was trained on the ImageNet data set. Ah. ImageNet has elephants and sea turtles and oscilloscopes and balloons and all sorts of things. Um, so 10,000 different things. Uh, so we trained the model on that uh, data set and then, um, and then used that model to process the shoes. And, and the feature extraction set was processing through that train network and then pulling out the features in the last layer. Mm -hmm. But this could also process your knowledge of the process and you can process the train Yeah. Yeah. And then you could use the software to just make the train for computers. Like you could use a lot of their. That's right. 
That's right. So, so that, that's, uh, that's, that's written in our contract. That's the uh, top. So you can now use this one model that was trained on one set of images, but then use it to process other kinds of images to do a more specific task. And it turns out to work for So uh, when you take your video on a first frame of an image net and you cut it to get like this vector picture that you yeah. uh, use on the demo, uh, do you get it at the very far end, or is it better to cut you in the middle so that it seems more general? In this case, in this case, we're going all the way to the end. Um, you can play around. You can choose any of the extractors you choose. Dif as far as I understand, dif different tasks um, do you do better in different uh, hierarchies or uh, different level of hierarchy. But with this one, it turned out to be pretty good. Mm -hmm. so I've tried um, running measurements, statistics, to see how well you do. Like, you just train your shoes standing alone. Now, look for people with shoes on. Where is the shoe in the image? And how often do you find it? How often do you miss it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we, we haven't done that. Uh, what I can say is, um, so there's the, the famous uh, dogs versus cats. <laughs> that Google came out with uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so it was well shown that you do better um, doing a two-step process where you uh, do feature extract and then feed into a different model um, that the use the neural net to adjust and classify. Um, we had one person on that too. So you see that you do better to uh, basically use feature extraction using a neural net. Um, and then to feed those features into something like groups of trees uh, 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 to make the classification, then to just directly classify it. And the accuracy is actually pretty significantly different. So you, with that two-step process, it's something like 98% accurate, uh, which is extremely high and, and state-of-the-art. And if you're just using the normal that you're down around 10 to That's a significant. But it always depends on the particular task. Um, so uh, maybe there's something particularly special about dogs versus cats, but uh, so far it looks like that. <laughs> yeah. So the distance you were getting over the entire set was, you know, it seemed to jump to 40, and then the far end was 90. You know, is the close stuff? Is that just would be translations of, of the original image, or why? What, does that kind well, of sense judging. of distance hold up over the entire data set? It seems odd <laughs> that, that there's this big jump and it's only twice the distance to, to the far end of the data set, right? Yeah, so what's that tell you? Uh, I think all that tells you is that the distances aren't calibrated. Okay. So they're on some arbitrary scale yeah. and all you know is uh, all you know is that it's monotonically increasing. You know, it monotonically maps to some sort of scale or, uh, or, or uh, calibrated distance. In reality, it tells you that uh, yeah, I don't have anything more intelligent to say for that. <laughs> So you've been focusing on image search with yeah, deep yeah. learning. Um, data, I know, does all kinds of other uh, classification problems. And, so have, and here, you know, you've got ImageNet and yeah. Inkin and all of these, you know, giant brains uh, eating research into the problem. Can you try deep learning on some of the other kinds of problems that you experience? Yes. Yeah, so there's nothing deep learning happens to be good for images because there's not a lot of other tools that are good for, uh, for some of these kinds of tasks. There's something like text. We have all sorts of tools that do pretty well uh, uh, for these kinds of problems. Um, but it also turned out that uh, deep learning has been used for all of the tasks. So there's nothing special particularly about images. So you can, um, there's a good work on things like speech recognition and uh, 
and uh, contract extension. Right, well, I'm just wondering for, for you guys in particular, is there some area where deep learning has been advantageous versus other sort of you know, yeah, in, I mean, more traditional? Yeah, I mean, images, images is a similar trend. Um, you have to go, your problems end up being pretty complex if you have to use a sort of standard machine learning. But we actually, we, we have some examples of doing deep learning in context. Just following up on the distance a little bit. Yeah. Uh, do you find that the bullpen, because it seems like it was the, like the closest fit image is on the game, like 40 or 41 or whatever. But it seems also that this is the end and it fits more, so it's like a bit more structured. Because, for example, if you have like yeah, 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 yeah. Um, big angles, Big distance is for you, but yeah. Totally. Um, I, I have not, uh, but we have a bunch of different metrics. Um, we have cosine, we have, uh, uh, I forget what it's called, but the non normalized cosine. Uh, and, other metrics. and you can extend your own metrics. So we'll try it. Um, heard of a project at Stanford where they have 126 or so different classifiers that they use for images and then they try to differentiate uh, what they're looking at. Uh, how do you compare to that? Or is that <laughs> uh, we do not try to compare that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a answer. But you could build a pipeline like that using. So you should think about this, this task of one task, um, which you could do many such tasks. Going back to the text, do you guys uh, support recurrent neural networks? Um, I'm not sure, actually. What is your roadmap? Like, what is the, why I should uh, go for it? Why should you work for us? Yeah. No, 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 why should you be a <laughs> oh, 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 Because here, recently, uh, you know, what, a year ago, a drafter was, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Recently, we have been uh, shifted to Spark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back, you know? right. I just want to put in perspective, you know, I did invest a lot of uh, effort in graph line and all. So sometimes it goes, oh, no, now it is the uh, 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 Spark. Spark, yeah, yeah. yeah. Spark. I like the Spark, uh, sorry, graph a couple of years ago. I just want to again to relook at it. But then I'm just thinking, what is the roadmap like? Yeah, so I'll say two things here. So Spark is awesome. Um, and, and super, you know, today Spark really shines on making to do tasks faster, right? And so uh, it's a very natural thing to go in, replace a bunch of slow pipelines with something that's faster. Um, in general, um, I think there's, it's still kind of early days for NLM. Uh, so in another three years, four years, they'll probably have a lot. Uh, there, but you know, today it's a relatively small, uh, early library, let's say. Um, but Spark is still great, and we integrate with Spark, so you can directly uh, have a pipeline, create RDBs, and then uh, without instantiating those RDBs, transfer them to the next frame so you can stack and crash on create. For us, the, the roadmap is about. Um, uh, basically fi filling out the toolkits that we have today. So we'll be also adding more and more algorithms and, and also more task-oriented uh, toolkits. So um, we have stuff for images. Uh, we have a recommended toolkit, which has something like eight, uh, eight of the most important algorithms for, for recommending. Things like um, uh, uh, factorization machines with the uh, implicit uh, Loss function, a random loss function. Um, so that allows you to basically throw in not just co occurrence, but data describing your items and, and uh, users as well. Um, so, tasks like that we see are growing in popularity. So, we're, we're sort of more application oriented rather than uh, uh, basically here's, here's how you consume all of the knobs of the neural net, which we still also expose, but. Um, we have a number of people in the world that uh, 
I'm going to send it kind of down there. Folks, if this one builds something cool, we'll need something to look for But we'll be focusing a lot on that and then more on um, our production pieces too. So uh, today I can take one of these models, turn it into a fault tolerance generating service. There's more work to be done uh, and make that easier for the on premise as well. Um, and in the next uh, release, uh, we'll be sort of Graph Lab originally was known as a giant distributed system. That was super fast. Um, and if you look at what we've done to date, it's been focused on how do I make, how to get the most out of a single machine. Um, in the next release, uh, our then distributed, we'll have distributed machine and other things. So, um, those two pieces, making sure that we can um, deploy easily, manage what's deployed uh, easily. And then, you know, you think about any sort of practical task, you think about closing the feedback. And it turns out that folks don't have good options for live test building and how that works out. So I'm really good at that. Happy to talk about that. Thank you. Any questions? I should say, um, I have some, <coughs> I traveled like today. So I have some stickers for Schwag. Uh, <laughs> and, and feel free to come up and grab uh, uh, other stickers or um, a card to set up for the <laughs> conference. 50% off. Um, if you want to come up to San Francisco tomorrow, I'll be up there. Um, come grab me, I'm happy to talk to you. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. How do you differ from other companies like Hex Data and H2O or Metamon? Yeah, so it's, I don't know, it, it's early days right now for companies that are commercializing machine learning platforms. Um, there's pros and cons to all of us, um, and I think the market's huge, and there's plenty of space for, for each of us. Um, Hexadata's uh, really, um, really good, you'll uh, ask our next week. Um, uh, so they're super great uh, at scalable linear to project. Um, where uh, input features are new, and they have some great things that we just started uh, back in 2000. Um, uh, if you care about text, if you care about doing images fast, um, today anyway, we're, we're probably a better option for you. Um, Metamind is really great. Uh, and it's, yeah, Metamind is more of a machine learning as a service. Uh, so that's so Hexadata and us, I would say, are similar in that we, like our target audience is you guys. Um, people that are thinking about the problem and thinking about how do I apply machine learning to this, as opposed to um, sort of a plug and play, <coughs> give me an API that just gives me the answer. Image in, classification. Uh, and Metamind and a lot of other companies are more focused on that, which um, you know, moves you up the stack, which has its pros and cons. Um, if you think that your data is particularly special, and you think that you can squeeze more out of your data than a generic model that's, uh, uh, that everyone's using, um, then it's going to be better to choose a platform that you can not only get started fast, but then tune um, so that you can sort of uh, be the most competitive for each other. So we see that yeah, folks that use sort of black box recommendation software like this relevance. Um, a lot of folks are going away from that because if you're a series and uh, using a trail events, you basically have the same recommendations that you have if you're uh, making a trail events. So, where's where's my competitor? Uh, so, we're, we're pretty confident that you can do more interesting things if you have some access to that trail events. Okay, cool. Uh, let's thank Jonathan. I just don't mind if you just pick up trash around you and toss it as you go out. Um, and then I think there's some cool Norwegians over here. Hey. Hey.